Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to rewind just a little bit to catch you up to speed with context. Remember there was the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter wants to just have a camp out. He's going to go to Cabela's and get the stuff, and they're going to make s'mores and hang out with Elijah and Moses. God sets him straight, speaks loud enough that he can clearly hear it, and we know in 1 Peter later that there's recorded evidence that this thing really happened because somebody actually wrote it down and said, this is the voice that was spoken on that mountain. And then they come down off the mountain, and a couple of different gospel accounts show us some of the stuff that was going on, including the fact that some of the disciples, even though they had this great miraculous mountaintop experience, were arguing amongst themselves about who was going to be the greater among them in the kingdom. And that's one of those flat forehead moments when you go, guys, do you not get it yet? And so Jesus, continuing to find teachable moments, decides he's going to do some things to show them what kind of followers the Messiah demands and what he expects of his close followers that will eventually become apostles when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they become these 12 that are set apart from the rest of these inner circle disciples. So that's kind of where we are. He had called a child among them to show them this is the kind of childlike faith that I like to see. And unless you have a faith like this child, you're not going to see the kingdom. And we find out now that he's going to tell another story because it brings up something that uh, helps us know about lostness. I don't know about you, but when I grew up in church, there, was a, there were a couple of churchy words that got thrown around a lot. One of them was lost. And people would use that word as though we knew what it meant, and yet sometimes we have to define our terms and let people know where these terms came from. This is a passage that talks about what real lostness looks like, I think. To begin with, let me clue you in about something that happened, really happened in our family. This is back when my son was playing soccer. Joy and I were out on one of these nice cold Saturdays watching a soccer game at the sidelines, stamping our feet, trying to stay warm. And they had just invented cell phones by then, and my cell phone rang. It was a flip phone. And I answered it, and it was my daughter, Katie, the oldest girl. She had borrowed one of our cars because she was going to actually spend a week on campus where she was going to school at the time at Spring Arbor near Jackson, and then she was going to drive herself home. And she says, Daddy, I'm lost. I, I really don't know where I am. And I said, okay. Well, let's figure this one out. And all the people are screaming at the sidelines, so I had to walk as far away as I could to try to keep from having all these screaming parents in my ear. And I said, next time you come up on a green road sign, tell me what road it is, and let's see if we can pinpoint where you are exactly. She goes, oh, okay. Yeah, here's one. And she told me the road name, and I thought, (laughs) how how did you get there? She goes, I don't know. I, I thought I was going to take 127 to 50, and it was going to come right on that way. And I said, no, you're, you're not there. She goes, well, I know. That's why I called you. I said, all right. Well, let me think in the map in my brain, because we'd made that trip enough that I kind of knew where it was. And I thought, oh, I know what she did. She passed up 127, and instead, when she finally saw a road name that she thought she recognized, she went north instead of south. So she went from being lost to being really lost. And I said, first of all, you're going to have to make a U-turn as soon as it's safely possible. If you can't make a U-turn, turn right on a road, go around, come back. You need to go south instead of north. Okay. I said, now, you're probably going to be about 12 or 15 minutes before you hit this next major road, and that's where you're going to want to turn. So when you get close to that, like 10 minutes away, call me back, and I'll talk you through. She said, okay. And I went back, watched the game for a while, and then I thought, it's about that time. And sure enough, the phone buzzes I open it up. Okay, Daddy, I'm coming up on that turn again. I said, good. You're going to turn left, and it's this highway name. She goes, okay, I see it. Yep, yep, good. Are you on it? Yes, I am. I said, good. And then it just dawned on me. The last three times I'd been down that same road, it was a speed trap. And I knew that cops liked to hang out because it was a downhill run, and people could kind of let their speed get out of hand, and that cop would sit right at the bottom of that hill and wait for people to come so he could just get them with the little radar gun. And I said, oh, and by the way, honey, Yes, Daddy. Watch your speed through there. Cops like to hang out. She goes, oh, no. And I said, what? She goes, there's a cop behind me, and he's got his lights on. (laughs) You can't make this stuff up. I said, well, 
pull over as soon as it's safe and be kind to him and smile and tell him that your dad was on the phone with you trying to get you from, you know, back on track because you were lost. Call me back. <laughs> she calls me back about 10 minutes later. Well, daddy, it's okay. I started crying and he let me off with a warning. <laughs> The moral of the story, ladies, tears work. <laughs> and I asked her, how did it feel to be lost? She goes, it was awful. It was terrible because I felt so disoriented. I had no idea which end was even up. I didn't know where I was. I was so glad that your voice was able to finally direct me back so I could get home again. I don't know what you have felt like if you've ever been lost, but it's a bad feeling. And what we're going to see Jesus talking about lets us know that there's something exponentially worse than being physically lost somewhere. And that is to be spiritually lost or disconnected or apart from the embrace of a God who loves us and wants to be connected with us. It's an awful kind of lostness. Let's read it, Matthew 18, starting in verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that there are angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. We learn three basic things from this short but power-packed passage. We learn something about angels, and we're going to look in a little more depth to some of the angels because we learn something that some people have mistaken by taking it out of context, and I want to correct that to make sure you have a slightly more biblically correct version of what's going on with these angels. We learned something about the Good Shepherd, and we're going to pull back some of the threads that we started months ago that point all the way to the New Testament and look about the Good Shepherd. And then we're going to see very briefly, but it's the main point of the story, what's this Father's heart like? First of all, with angels, starting at verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Note, The child that he had called to be among them, and we've taken weeks to get through this passage, the child is still there. You know, the way that we might do it, you could sit the kid on the lap and maybe bounce the child up and down on your knee to keep him, you know, satisfied or quiet or whatever. I suspect that Jesus, being the gregarious, child-loving man that he was in a pure spirit, that kid may have been climbing all over him. We don't know. But the kid was still there. And so when he says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, he literally was probably pointing to or looking at a little one, a child. So the child can be literally a child, or it can be someone that means just a believer in Christ. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Their angels in heaven, that's plural. Little ones, both literal and figurative, and what does the Bible teach about how God works through good angels? Let's look at some angel, angelology for a couple of minutes, because I think this is important. First of all, we know that they protect humans. Remember Daniel in the lion's den? King Nebuchadnezzar throws Daniel down into the den. The angel comes down and shuts the mouth of the lion so that Daniel is still intact the next morning, and the king looks down and says, Oh, look, he's still there. Yay! And so he makes this proclamation. It's a great thing because it shows that God, Yahweh God, the God of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's another story but same book, is the God who is more powerful than even the stuff that this king can throw at them. So he protects humans. God will use angels to protect humans. Also, angels can reveal information, specific information to specific people at specific times for a specific purpose. Normally when something big is supposed to happen, like in Zechariah. We hear about that very often around Christmas time. Zechariah, the priest, is ministering in the temple. An angel appears when he's back there, inside, away from all the other people, and says, Zechariah, your wife Elizabeth is going to give you a son, and you are to name him John. John, John, John. And you remember Zechariah becomes 
mute. He can't speak for a while, and he comes out shocked because this angel has visited him, and he has to either write notes or speak in sign language for a while until finally that prophecy is fulfilled, and then his tongue is loosed. So he speaks specific information, but it was to one person on this occasion because of a specific thing God had in mind. He will also guide people. There's Acts 8, 26 through 28. Philip, when God is the first Siri, the GPS, who says to Philip, I want you to go down on the desert road, and when you do that, it's on a need-to-know basis. Just go there first, and then I'll show you. When you get there, you'll know what to do next. And so then when he gets down there, he says, oh, see that chariot? Now, I want you to go up and talk to that guy in the chariot. And it was the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading from the book of Isaiah and didn't know what it meant. And, of course, Philip was able to evangelize this guy. He says, hey, let's even baptize you. There's some water. He was involved in evangelism in a very supernatural, unusual way because he spoke through an angel to Philip. Angels are generally just ministering spirits. They minister to believers. That's what it says in Hebrews 1.4. They are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. means believers. Here's the big question. And this is where some people can kind of get a little bit strange and off track if we're not careful. People love to be able to make mountains out of molehills and make bigger things theologically than the Bible actually says to the detriment of serving God and keeping Him preeminent. So that's my caution here. That's why I say it's important that we get this right. Does every individual believer have one specific guardian angel? My answer, the short answer is, there's not strong enough biblical evidence for us to say definitively, yes, that's the case. That may be a surprise to you. Why? Because so many people have taught it for so long that people just buy into that and say, oh yeah, of course, we all have a guardian angel. I have a guardian angel. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't explicitly say so. God assigned the archangel Michael to the nation of Israel. Is a nation an individual? No, it's a whole bunch of people. It's a nation. Angels were sometimes sent to deliver information, very specific things like Mary and Joseph. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, Mary. You've been chosen. You're the maid servant. God has chosen you for a special task. You're going to give birth to God's son. And to Joseph, you know, by the way, Joseph, don't divorce her. (laughs) And after all this had taken place, uh, take your family to safety down in Egypt. There are certain specific things that God's angels did for specific reasons, but those weren't necessarily assigned one-to-one angel to person. We never see that written. The notion grew, this whole angelology thing grew between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jews had really developed and kind of overdeveloped the idea that there is a guardian angel one for one through that intertestamental period. But when we really look into it and dig in, we just can't find evidence in Scripture other than using extra biblical sources, and we've got to be very cautious about doing that because some of those were not God inspired. Some of these things like the Gospel of Thomas, for example, probably written by Gnostics, which actually had an axe to grind and were trying to distort the truth. Be cautious if you see something on the Internet that says, oh, we found a new gospel. (coughs) Red flags should go up because if it's not in the canonized gospel, it's probably not truth. So it says, for I tell you, this is Matthew 18, 10b, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. There, T-H-E-I-R, in the Greek, is a possessive plural pronoun, which just means generically speaking, there's a plurality of angels, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're assigned one for one for each of these children. So what we do know, and this is the good stuff, believers are served by angels in general and not by specific guardian angels. They always see the face of my Father in heaven. What does that signify? I thought, yeah, that's interesting. He he should use a physical description of angels, and they're always facing toward God the Father. Why is that? It's a figure of speech that helps us understand that they're always watching to see what the next command is going to be. They want to know when God speaks, they're ready to go into action right away. When I was in a musical group, and we were rehearsing to get ready to go on tour, Continental Singers, Brad, our director, tried to do something to show us how insistent he was that we always keep our eyes on him and not to get distracted. Because we had certain songs that if you're going to have a ritardando, when it's going to get slow, you have to get slow together so that when you come in together, again, you're all together. And in the middle of one of the rehearsals, I was playing trombone, the singers were singing on the risers, and in walks the assistant director. He's a funny guy, Scott. Scott walked in. He had on this 
red plastic fireman's helmet with a light on top that was going around like that. So, I mean, you can't miss him. When the guy walks in the room like that and there's this light on top of his head going, everybody was just, they started laughing. They were mesmerized. And Brad said, stop it. Don't look at him. Look at me. I don't care if the building is on fire. I don't care. I want you to look at me. And we laughed about it, but we got his point. He wanted us to keep our eyes firmly set on the director so that we would be in step and to follow his commands. That's the angels. The angels are always looking to make sure that they are right, Johnny on the spot. If God says, go, I got an assignment for you, boom, they're going to respond instantaneously. There is a person named Joan Wester Anderson. She wrote a book called Where Angels Walk. For some reason, somebody told somebody else and news reached Joan Wester Anderson, who lives just out of Chicago, Wheaton or somewhere. And uh, she called me on the phone and she said, I understand you have an angel story and I'm collecting angel stories for a book I'm writing. Would you write your story up and email it to me and do I have permission to edit it for length and can I include that in my book? Okay. So I did and she edited it and it's included in that book. And I started reading through a lot of these anecdotal, this really happened to me kind of stories. And one thing I'm proud of Joan for doing, she wanted to make sure that her theology was clear, we're not supposed to worship angels. And that's where I started to feel a little wigged out about her request for me to share my story because what happens in a lot of cases is people will hear some sensationalistic story and they'll turn their focus away from worshiping Jesus Christ and elevating Him to the exalted status that God Himself has elevated Him to. And they'll start to really get into the supernatural and the angelic and all this kind of stuff. And we have to be really cautious about that. Because the rest of the New Testament is extremely clear. It's abundantly clear. Anything that starts to diminish Jesus Christ and his preeminence is dangerous. And we need to watch out very carefully that we don't do that. Shortly after that book came out, I was in a bookstore in Adrian, Michigan. A lady came in and recognized me because I had a column in the newspaper at that time. And she says, oh, I just read your story in this book about the angel. Tell me about it. And so I did a little bit, and she asked me a few more questions, and I could tell she was really enamored by this whole angel thing. And so I said, you know, I have to be really cautious, and I don't want to diminish your enthusiasm for this, but I think one of the reasons that people don't have more angel encounters is because we would start worshiping the angels and turn our hearts away from God and away from Jesus Christ. And I think that their job is to help point people to Jesus Christ and get them connected with him. He's the head of the body. The angels aren't. And we have to be real real cautious about that. She seemed like I kind of rained on her parade a little bit. I think she wanted me to be a little more enthusiastic about what had happened. And I was actually quite cautious because I don't want to be an agent of turning people away from putting Christ preeminent in their life. It's important that we know it is God who watches over us. Here's the good news, folks. You don't have to worry about your special angel, if you each have one or not. I don't think we do. We don't have to worry about that because God is the one who sees. He's omniscient. Angels aren't. Isn't it good for us to know that God knows our circumstance? He knows Lydia in Kenya and Uganda. She knows ex- he knows exactly what's going on in her life and what steps she needs to take and where. Same with Anna in Bangladesh. Same with Mark Sturkin, who's going back to Haiti to do more pastor training next month. And then our elders are going to be there in March. All these different things. God is omniscient, and he's not limited in any way. Angels are not omniscient. So it's just, I want to put things in perspective here by saying, when we understand that these angels are doing the bidding of God, don't think that you're so special that you've got an angel all to yourself. Not like Clarence on It's a Wonderful Life. Second, we learn about the good shepherd in this passage, verses 11 through 13. Let's get some Old Testament context and reach back and find that thread that we're going to follow in the tapestry that pulls us to where we are. Jesus does something so purposefully, and he will use certain words in such a way that you know his Jewish audience is going, I see what you did there. And he does that sometimes when he quotes. He'll either take a quote exactly the way it is from an Old Testament scripture, or sometimes he'll take that quote and turn it on its head and say the exact opposite, but use it in a way that they would go, oh, contrast. 
He's saying, this is the old covenant, this is the new covenant. And I say to you, and then he would say the new thing. Ezekiel 34, we see that Ezekiel, the prophet of God, gets this word from God that says, Ezekiel, I want you to say, and the Lord saith this. I mean, when God says through his prophets in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, that was authority. He said, and I quote, very few people today can say, I just spoke to the Lord today, and he told me to tell you this, and I quote, I would be cautious if somebody said that. In the Old Testament, he was speaking through prophets, and he did it that way, and he would say, all right, these are not good shepherds. The word of the Lord came to me, meaning Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, and I quote, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? This is a prophet speaking to the leaders of Israel. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. Doesn't this sound like Messiah? The things that Messiah did? You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost? Isn't that what Jesus is teaching us in Matthew's gospel? What we're supposed to be doing and they weren't doing it? You have ruled them harshly and brutally. I myself. Who's speaking now? Remember, thus saith the... This is God talking. He says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. When is he going to do it? He's going to do it when he sends the Son, which is God incarnate, Messiah, Savior of the world, and he's showing us in Matthew's gospel that he is the one to fulfill what he said he would do in Ezekiel's prophecy. In the New Testament, the people Jesus calls to follow him are the same people the Pharisees and scribes disdained. Look at the people Jesus is hanging out with. It's the riffraff. It's the people, the scribes and Pharisees were going, wow, if he just knew what she was like. He's crying and putting tears all over his feet. She's using her hair to wipe it off. These Pharisees and scribes were really not compassionate people at all. And they didn't want to go after the kind of people that Jesus went after. And Jesus is trying to show not only through example, but through his words. We've got to be compassionate toward these people. The little ones among us, if we're going to be like Christ. The New Testament context, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Total opposite of what we see in Ezekiel. My parents had two different trips to Israel before they went to heaven. And they told us secondhand stories, which were really cool. And then I found the slides and scanned them after I got them back from Arizona. And they said, uh, one time on one of the trips, they were out in the shepherd's field. And they had their guide who said, I can see the shepherd right here who's actually watching real sheep because they still do that over there. He said, I want him to do something. It's a really neat experiment, and he's going to show you something that comes right out of Scripture. He said, we need a volunteer from your tour group. There were about 20 people in their group. One of them volunteered. He said, okay, come over here. This is the call in Aramaic, which is hala kabokaba, you know, whatever it was. I don't know what it was. I don't speak Aramaic. And so they said, say that and say it three times authoritatively like you're calling the sheep. And so this volunteer went, ah, come on, come on. And he goes, no, no, with authority. He said, say it right out there. Use your outdoor voice. And she goes, okay. Allah, come on, come on. And the sheep just went on grazing. They're, they're like, whatever. They're eating and eating and eating. He said, okay, get somebody else, another, another volunteer. Maybe somebody else has a better, you know, ring to it. And so he brought somebody else. This time it was a guy. He goes, okay, say it loudly. And he goes, Allah, come on, come on. And the sheep just looked up like, oh, quit bothering us. And they just kept eating. And then he said, now, shepherd, I want you to call the sheep. He just very quietly said, hello, kabah, kabah. And the sheep started looking up like, oh, okay, it must be supper time. They started walking toward the shepherd. And everybody in the whole tour group went, whoa, that's so cool. Because it wasn't just the command itself. It wasn't the words. These sheep recognized his voice. And it was such a neat, spine-tingling moment that my mom said, I got it. This passage came alive for me because I realized the shepherd cares for the sheep and the sheep knows the shepherd's voice. They recognize it. John 10, 24, he had an interaction with some Pharisees. They didn't get it because they didn't recognize the voice. They said, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Well, he'd been showing them stuff and he says, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. And he'd been doing a ton of them. 
but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. He made his point. My sheep listen to my voice, he says. I know them. They will follow me. I give them eternal life, he says, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that good news? What a great shepherd. What do you think, he asks. He's going on to enlighten these people. when He's got this child among them, and he's trying to say this parable. Why does he use parables? Because he wants to get them to think. And he even opens the parable by saying, what do you think? That means put on your thinking cap. Let me tell you this little story. Instead of telling them, he uses a question mark and asks this parable in the form of a question. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? We were on our way out of the stadium and Steve turns to me last night and was, you know, 100,000 people and we're all trying to make our way to the cars and the parking lots and stuff. And he says, so let me ask you, if one of your sheep had wandered and they're still stuck back in the stadium, are you going to go back and look for them? I thought, oh, I don't know. (laughs) I'm really cold and it's a long way back there. The point that Jesus is trying to make is it was difficult. This is not an easy task. And it was that stubborn sheep like Steve mentioned in the worship time. This is that crazy wandering off sheep that's probably done it again and again and again. His name was probably Sammy. Why is it that all the rascals that that were named Sammy? When I was growing up, all of you know that there's that one kid that he's got that one name that I'm never going to name my kid that because the kids that that name I know that they're rascals. In my life, he was Sammy. He's the kid that's always going to be into something. You go, where's Sammy? Oh, I don't know. Let's go find him. He's wandering off and says, if a man owes a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, even Sammy, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? It's a question that assumes a yes answer. They're going to say, well, yeah, of course he is because he's a good shepherd. What kind of a shepherd would he be if he didn't do that? I wouldn't take my three kids on a family vacation camping and then one of the kids come back and says, Dad, we lost Callie. I said, well, we got Katie and Clarkie. You know, quality over quantity. (laughs) I would never say that. Because, of course, I miss my Callie, and I'd have to go after her. I would go over mountains. If you ask me to climb up a mountain, I'd swim the deepest oceans to get my Callie back. You're welcome. All the sheep are precious to God. That's what he's trying to show us. The heart of God is that he cares for even the one that wanders off. He cares about every sheep personally. He cares about you personally. And I don't care what you've done in your life. He still cares about you personally. I don't care how many times you've wandered away from him. He still cares about you personally. Jesus did not want his apostles to lead like the Pharisees and scribes. And so he keeps instructing them You are going to be different than these folks. I want you to have this faith of a child. I want you to be compassionate. I want you to care for these people, not like the folks that Ezekiel had to take to task or that God took to task through Ezekiel. The point is not the 99. Some people worry about the 99. Well, what happened to the 99? It's not the point. Maybe there were some other shepherds left. If you had 100 sheep there, they probably had more than one shepherd. You could take care of them. The point is not the 99. The point is the one. And we should care for them as much as God cares for them. What about those people that God sends? And I told you years ago when we were back at Lincoln High School, sometimes in ministry it's going to get loud and it's going to get messy. And grace is messy. The elders are reading a book called Messy Grace. Sometimes it's messy. And people show up and they don't act and look or or use the same language that the rest of us churchy people use. And it's going to get messy, and sometimes they're not as far along in certain areas of their walk as we are. And it's so easy for us to pick and choose and categorize which sin we think is worse than our sins. Hey, we're all sinners, aren't we? What's going to happen when God sends us messy grace people, and are we going to be gracious enough to say, that's the one that wandered off? We're going to care for this one. We're going to love this person and embrace them, even though they're different than we are, so they can embrace Christ one day. And it may take them years to get to that point. Are we going to love them enough to embrace them, even if they're different than we are, for years? And then we learn about the Father's heart. Here's the main point, and it's brief, but it's powerful. 
We learn about the Father's heart in verse 14. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. That's the Father's heart. That's his desire. Will everybody be saved? Is this talking about universalism? That because of Christ, his blood covers everybody, and therefore, even if you reject him, you're still going to wind up in heaven anyway. No. Be cautious about that. No, we can't take this passage and turn it into a universalistic passage. It's like lifeguard training. I was 16 years old. I became a junior lifeguard. Never made it to senior. Some of you are lifeguards. Rachel, you're a lifeguard. It's tough training, isn't it? Sometimes they send you out to do stuff that you think, I don't know if I'll be able to do this or not. Like when they give you the adult and you tell the adult, I want you to fight all the way back when you're doing your final thing. Because sometimes the very people you're trying to save will fight you and climb up on you and they'll drown you if you're not careful. The desire of a lifeguard's heart is that we want to save every one of those drowning people. But the truth is, we can throw them a life preserver. You can throw one and get it right out there, right in front of them, within reach. But you can't make them grab hold of that which will save them. They have to make the choice to do that. And the Bible is so clear about this. God, through Jesus Christ, threw us a lifesaver. But it's up to us to grab a hold of that which will save us. We can choose to reject him. It can be right in front of us, and we can choose to walk away from him and still remain lost like that wandering sheep. And my heart breaks for those that I've seen make that decision and defy God. And I want so desperately for them to say, I want to embrace Christ, and yes, I want to be saved, because that kind of lostness is so much worse than any other kind of lostness there is because it lasts forever. True story. I was a kid probably... 10 years old, I'm guessing. And I used to hear other sides of a phone conversation. You know when you're a kid and you hear your parents talking on the phone, you only get one half of the conversation? I saw such patience in my mom and dad, especially my dad. There's a lady named Lucille. She was one of these lost, wandering souls that kept wandering away, and God kept reeling her back in again. And my dad was so patient because he'd say, Oh, hello, Lucille. How are you doing? And my mom would go, You'd see that look on her face, which means dad's going to be on the phone for 20 or 30 minutes. So let's go ahead and eat, kids, because his supper is going to get cold. And she was compassionate in the way she did it, but sometimes there was a little bit of exasperation there because sometimes when Sammy wanders away, people are exasperated. You know what I'm saying? Lucille was this person who could exasperate people. She'd lived a tough life. She had a tough family. It seemed like everything that happened was always drama surrounding her family. And my dad would patiently listen, and he would guide her, and he would say, well, let me me tell you what the Scripture says about that. And he always found the right words to say to help calm her down and point her back in the right direction. And you know what? Lucille, over the years, got to be one of the dearly cherished sheep in my dad's congregation. We all loved her, and we all knew she was a mess But we all loved her because it was a Lucille mess, and she was our Lucille, and so we loved her. And I just want so badly for this whole congregation to be filled with Christ-like, Sammy-loving, Lucille-loving, sheep-chasing people so that God can work through us even when grace gets messy. Let's pray that we'll become that kind of people, shall we? Father... I'm so grateful that you kept chasing me even though I tried to wander away from time to time. I'm grateful that I didn't have to worry about jumping through so many hoops like some people have. I had good parents. I had church-going, believing parents, and yet I still chose to be defiant at times. And yet I know that there are just some people who are just, they've got difficult lives, and they've got stuff going on in their hearts that we don't know about. And I pray that this congregation is going to be so gracious and so loving that we won't water down the truth, but we'll love people enough to tell them the truth and we'll earn the right to tell the truth because we love them so much that they know they're loved, even if they're different than we are. And I pray that you'll help remind us just how forgiving and gracious you were to each of us because we have a lot to be grateful for. May we not take that grace for granted. And may we be sheep-chasing people just like you are. And I pray it in Jesus' name.